for this uh, uh, EDSC course on digital demography. And um, as I mentioned, my name is Diego Budes. I'm a postdoc researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Demographic Research in the Lab of Digital and Computational Demography. Um, so I would I'd like to thank you all for being here. And um, so this course was, um, the, so the topics that we are going to be covering this week, uh, the way that this is organized has is the result of several workshops that uh, we have been organizing um, throughout the years now. And um, so I've been adding things and removing things. And we, we are going to cover, so most of you were interested in simply knowing what digital demography is, uh, what the data sources are, what we can use it for, and um, also privacy, of course, is a is a major concern. And uh, and we're gonna we're gonna discuss it um, a bit today. And I would recommend uh, there is a paper in the reading list um, by Susanna Subov if I'm not mistaken, which is in the optional readings for today. Um, big Other, Surveillance Capitalism. So if you, and this is also a book that came out recently. Um, so that's a reading that I would definitely recommend for the subject of, of privacy. And, and we're gonna cover this, but also feel free to bring up these issues as we, as we go, as we explore different data sources and approaches. Uh, we, we can keep this in mind. Uh, because it is it is very important. Um, so one thing that we're not going to cover directly is uh, web scraping. So we, of course, we only have uh, four days effectively of lectures. So we needed to uh, make some decisions about things that, uh, that we should cover. But I can definitely uh, recommend some some resources for that. Um, OK, so I hope that everyone managed to download the presentations. Um, if you did not manage to do that, please get in touch afterwards and we can figure out uh, and we can figure out uh, a way to do that. So what I would like to do now is share my screen and then uh, we would I will start with the, okay. So I hope that you can all see my screen now. And then we'll just start with this presentation, which is, um, which is in the, in the folder that I shared with you in the, in the GitHub uh, repository. So I'm gonna go through the whole GitHub thing in a bit. Um, but first I just wanted to um, let you know what I thought that uh, we could discuss today. So we basically have one hour remaining and uh, some of that is still gonna be used in some housekeeping for the course. So today, basically, we're just gonna speak about this and then we would move towards an introduction to the to digital demography and um, also give you a brief overview about the data that is available, some of the approaches, like how this data has been studied. And we're gonna take a bit of a, like historical archeological view today, looking at some of the old studies, like where, where this whole idea came from of the of digital demography. Um, but we're also gonna cover some current topics. So which questions are interesting for uh, digital, Demographers or demographers who are interested in digital sources, what are they looking at? Um, yeah, so this is the plan for today. But today is a bit of a different uh, different setup uh, than the other days. So first of all, welcome to the course. Uh, I just wanted to introduce the members of the Laboratory of Digital and Computational Demography at the Max Planck Institute. So. So in many ways, this uh, things that we're going to be discussing is also the product of work that we've uh, been conducting uh, as a team. Um, so you can also go to the website and read a bit more about the work that we do. Okay, so in terms of the setup for this course, as we're all aware, 
this is a digital course. So, I mean, an online course. It's a digital course, but will be delivered in an online format. Um, and we basically are going to meet four times this week. I'm um, just going to check that you're all there. Uh, so we're going to meet uh, four times this, um, this week. And uh, we are going to cover these four topics. So the first one is the introduction to the field. Then we're going to speak about crowdsourced online data. Then we'll speak about digital trace data. And then we will speak a bit about computational approaches and uh, simulation. Um, so, so this is sort of organized around data sources, as you, as you will see. Um, another way of organizing this would have been around uh, substantive interests. Um, but I thought this would give us a clearer structure. And then within each topic, we can, uh, so we're going to look at a couple of studies a bit in depth. Um, and uh, so these are in the syllabus. I'm going to get there in a second. Um, and, uh, and we're going to explore the different subjects. So there are several threads that will run uh, through uh, this uh, four days of the course. One of them is uh, data sources. Another one is substantive interest. And another one is limitations of the data. And the other one is the new possibilities that this uh, types of data open uh, up for researchers. And Friday, we're not going to meet uh, virtually, but um, you'll have some time to work on the final assignment. And I'm going to get to that now in a sec. So the setup of the course, um, online lectures, we're going to meet here. and. Um, so I, I made uh, following the some I got your feedback for last week and um, so I adapted the course a bit. One of the things uh, that I did is make the our lectures a bit shorter. So we are only going to meet for one and a half hours every day. Uh, but then there is also this office hour period uh, in the afternoon. So if you would like to discuss something, um, send me an email and. In the okay, send me an email and then we can arrange uh, an office hour period. So basically, I have this. Hope you can see it. So this is like the schedule for office hours where we can meet Monday to Friday from two to three. So there are these fifteen minutes uh, time slots and uh, just drop me an email and I can put you in the calendar, and then we can discuss uh, things related to your project or some of the things that we covered in the course. Um, so all of the material is in the GitHub repository. Uh, I hope you all have this, uh, this link. So what I would recommend is that you download the whole repository. And I'm going to go through this quickly. Um, so if you can just. Maybe, is there anyone who has not downloaded the repository? OK. OK, that's quite good. So I guess there's no need to go through that. Um, but just a quick overview. So you, you can download the repository as a zip file here. Um, I would recommend that because some of the, for the assignment, for example, we are going to be working on data that is stored. So, so, I'm, so the way that the assignment is written now is that the, the R script uses relative paths so that it knows where to find the data, for example. So if you change things around, it will not find the data. Um, but um, anyway, so this is the repository of the course. You can find the syllabus here, um, this one here. And if you open the syllabus, then uh, you will see that there is a general introduction to the course, the, the goals of uh, this week, um, which is basically to uh, present you with the recent advances in the field of digital and computational demography, also a definition, I hope, 
of uh, of what this is since um, so this is one of the things that you are most interested in um, and also an approach to the data and the methods that we are using to do this kind of research specifically as it concerns uh, demographic research right because the so you will have seen that from the the one of the readings today um, from the book bit by bit by Matthew Solganik. So this this concerned the use of digital data for social science in general. And I think, um, so if you haven't had time to look at this, I would strongly recommend that you do. It is um, it's a very good resource. And um, so I only, I only asked you to read the introduction today, but the, but the whole book is very good and it's all available online. So it's a resource that we can uh, make use of. The third goal of the course is to, to introduce this element of critical thinking. Um, when we think of modern demographic analysis uh, using online data. And also this idea of data-driven discovery. Um, so one, one thing that we, that we usually have to negotiate when we are thinking of digital demography is, is that it's very interdisciplinary. Inter interdisciplinary. And um, so in our lab, for example, we work, it's a combination of we have demographers, we have other social scientists, we have sociologists, for example, and we have computer scientists, and uh, we have statisticians. And so this collaboration between fields is quite common in also other areas of demography. Of demography. It's a bit easier to see. Uh, but, but in digital demography, we collaborate with fields that we would traditionally maybe not collaborate with in other areas uh, of demography, in better established areas of demography, uh, using survey data or census data. Um, in particular, the collaboration with people from computer science uh, and this new discipline of data science is something that uh, is very rewarding and that uh, we can definitely learn a lot about each other. Um, and we're going to get back to this uh, with the concrete example of uh, the drifting, the phenomenon that uh, uh, Matthew Sargani calls uh, drifting in, in his book, where where this collaboration with computer scientists can be very helpful for understanding the way in which the data is generated. Um, but it also, but it also implies a lot of negotiating uh, with the with people from these other disciplines uh, who may come from different traditions, from different uh, research traditions, but also have different epistemologies and think about problems think about solving problems in a different way. Um, so it's interesting to be in this, uh, in this position where, where, where you are um, kind of with one foot in the social sciences and specifically in demography, which has a very particular way of looking at problems and another foot in the, the more technical uh, computer science uh, department. So we're also gonna speak a bit uh, a bit about those uh, tensions and uh, how we can address them. So I have mentioned how this is organized. Um, so before we uh, speak about the final assignment, is there uh, any question so far about the organization of the course or the subjects that we will cover? Um, okay, I guess. No question. Thanks. Okay. Great. Um, right. Okay. So this is the general setup. The also, if you go to GitHub, you can see that the there's a folder called presentations, and uh, we have one directory for each of the weeks. Um, and you will generally be interested in the PDF file. Um, so there's also the R markdown if you want to commit to the document again, which maybe is not important. Um, 
but it's there. Okay, so there is no uh, evaluation at the end of the course. Instead, there is an assignment that you will be working on uh, throughout this week. And the idea of this is to bring you in contact with a source of digital data. Um, so this is also, the, this is a course I designed. So another thread that you will see running uh, through these four days is, uh, is connected to the issues that I have as a scientific interest in. So in particular, um, kinship dynamics, um, kind of uh, long-term trends in fertility, in mortality. So this uh, big picture descriptive um, demography. Um, so this is in, in a way reflected in the choice of uh, readings um, and also in the way in the data for the assignment. Um, and, and I think this is a nice way also of, uh, of bringing together the different components uh, of the course uh, by focusing on one uh, substantive area. So, so this area that we will focus um, on in, in the assignment is the, is the question of how can we use crowdsourced genealogical data uh, and extract meaningful demographic value from it, and um, and this so this this will um, include using um, R to conduct some hands-on analysis of this data, but also thinking a bit about what the processes are behind this data that generated this data and uh, how this data can how these processes um, can affect the way uh, our estimates. So we will be using this database called FamilyLinks. And um, so I'm going to give you a more complete introduction to, the, to this data on, uh, in day uh, two, so tomorrow. And so, but it basically is a um, very large genealogical data set. So it, it includes uh, family trees for 80 million people around the world, and it covers a very long time, time span. And it was constructed by amateur genealogists. So basically, people who are interested in their own family history and then just start making the family trees in this platform that is like a Facebook for genealogists. And, um, and then someone curates this data. And so this is why it's nice also to use as an exercise, because there has been a lot of effort already in um, in curating this data, but it also poses a challenge because we don't necessarily know what what this cleaning meant. And so often, data cleaning is uh, is a very important part of the analysis that is not usually considered part of the analysis. But um, but we make many decisions during this process of data cleaning that. Um, that can affect our outcome significantly. Uh, so what, another thing that we are uh, we have been very interesting in our lab and um, and in the institute uh, at the Max Planck Institute at, at large is is the issue of transparency and uh, reproducibility. Um, in particularly, the idea that we we should make our the material that we used to produce our results should be open and uh, it should be shared so that other people can replicate the result that, uh, that we are presenting. Um, and, and, and this is important in the context of digital data because sharing, let's say, the code that we use to arrive at a, res at a result usually involves at, at least three stages, which is the first stage is obtaining the data. So when you do traditional demographic data, you so you get a survey, for example, that is representative of a country, of an area, and, and you get weights. And so in a way, you obtain the data from a provider that gives you the certainty that that data works, that that data makes sense. And, and you don't need to worry um, 
too much. Like, of course, there are issues also with undersampling and, and these kind of things with access, uh, with like bias in the questions. But you can be fairly certain that that you're obtaining a quality product. And and then you clean this. Uh, okay, so to go back to my previous idea, then like if you have this clean product, then you can just recode variables or whatever it is you're doing. And that is your data cleaning process, right? And this is the first of three stages of the things that you want to share. The second one is the analysis in itself. So if you like are running a regression, if you are completing a life table, and the third one is how you turn those analyses and create products that you're going to present, right? You create the table, you create the figure. Um, so like we are usually, we're used to think of those two last steps as the, as the ones that are the most important, where, where we should, the things that we should share. But there's also this first component of the data cleaning that since you've, you've done empirical data analysis, then you know that this is actually the, um, the part that probably takes more time. And when you're working with very dirty data, um, such as internet data, so online data is, is very dirty data, as we'll see in a bit, then this step becomes very important because decisions that you make at this stage are gonna influence your, your results. And the problem is that you usually, when you obtain a product, you don't have that, that uh, assuring, assurement, that, that certainty that you're obtaining a quality product. Um, okay, but we're gonna get, get back to this. So what, what I mean is that this, the, the reason why I brought this up is because this family links data set that we're gonna use for the assignment has the authors do provide a certain level of security to us that this data has been curated and it is okay to use. Um, and this, so the reading for tomorrow is uh, precisely uh, one paper where they try to assure us that this data works. So we have this genealogical data set that you, um, uh, that you can download. So I'm not gonna spend much more time on this because we will do that tomorrow. But I just wanted to mention the three exercises. Um, so there's exercise one, two, and three. Um, you can go through them, uh, but basically the first exercise, we, we have to compute the lifespan. Uh, so, right, sorry, the, so the data that I provided you is not the full data, not the 80 million profiles, but a smaller version of the data that only refers to Sweden. Um, so we only have uh, profiles for Sweden and why Sweden, uh, the same reason why many people study Sweden is that we can actually compare our estimates to estimates from the human mortality and the human fertility database, uh, which is, has a very long um, uh, so we, we have this very long time frame that we where we observe Sweden. Um, so the first exercise is kind of uh, hands on. Um, look at the data, estimate the group people by cohort and then estimate. Uh, lifespan and a uh, short description of your findings. The second one is a bit more uh, theoretical. So it speaks about the, the way that the authors in tomorrow's reading uh, conceptualize lifespan and life expectancy. And if there is a distinction between the two terms, uh, what that is, if, and, and then um, you will also need to do some, um, some visualizations from the data which uh, from a technical standpoint um, should be doable in one day. Um, but you're also free to, feel free to get in touch with me if you, if you really get stuck with something. Um, and the last exercise is, um, is a reflection about the sources of, the, of bias in online genealogies. So this is, I hope that um, many of the subjects that we cover throughout the week Will, will help you uh, approach this problem of bias um, in a more wholesome way. So bias is one of the big questions in, when it comes to, to doing research with digital sources. I'm just gonna check that everyone is still there, yes. Um, 
And um, so it's important to start thinking about this and, um, and also thinking about how to address the, the, the bias once we have identified. Okay, so the assignment is due Friday at midnight and um, please send it to me um, via email. So the last thing I wanna say about the assignment is that if you go to the folder assignment on GitHub, then you will see a folder called data. So here we have the Sweden genealogy. This is the family links data. And then there's another one called Sweden Soxim. And this we're gonna discuss in the last day. So this is a similar data set, but created through micro simulation. Um, and in the R folder, you have an R markdown. Um, file. So the idea is that you work everything, uh, you write the whole code for all the exercises in R Markdown, and um, and then you knit a PDF file. So we're gonna come to this in one second. Uh, okay, I think that's it for the assignment. Um, and then from page four on, you have the lecture plan. And this is for every day, the readings that are required and the readings that are optional. I would um, ask you to read the required readings and the optional readings cover different uh, subjects that are related to the main area of uh, each day. And we're also gonna cover them in the, um, so in the presentation, I will refer to, this, uh, to these readings. So, Usually I try to order them in order of relevance. So if you can only read one reading, uh, then do read the first one. Um, so the, the exception is uh, this first week where I already recommended this uh, Tsubov paper about surveillance capitalism. So I think that's pretty good. And then I also, there is a suggested homework. So I'm not gonna check any of these homework. And we're also gonna go through them at the end of every day. Um, but these are things that I suggested you do, and they're mainly related to the assignment. Uh, so for example, today I suggested you download all the resources and that you try out to need an, uh, a document for, from the, the file that I, that I just mentioned. Mm. And that you review the assignment instructions. Right, so it's, it's nothing that, um, it should uh, add too much extra extra work. Okay, so any questions? Okay, so before, just before the questions. So the last point is the requirements. So you should all have a running installation of RStudio. And, um, and these packages, you should install these packages. Uh, Tidyverse, which you probably already have uh, from Teams core. Data table, which is a package that we use for, uh, we're gonna use for reading um, very large uh, data sets uh, efficiently into R and need R and R markdown, which are the ones that you have um, probably used already with him uh, to, to knit uh, documents. Um, and then you also need a running uh, version of MicTech, Tech Life or something else to compile your uh, R Markdown document. Um, if you don't, then there is also this tiny tech package in R, which works very well. If you don't have a, an installed version of uh, any distribution of uh, LaTeX, uh, so you basically just install it like a normal package and it, it should work. It should get you the R Markdown to work. Okay, so that was a lot of information. Um, can you please let me know if, if it's clear, if you have any questions? It's okay, thank you. Um, okay, so no questions. Right, so the other thing that, um, that we may do, depending on, on on how we are doing with the lectures, is maybe take a break in the middle, um, so five or ten minutes, um, 
so we can stand up, stretch a bit, and, uh, and then come back a bit more focused. Um, right. OK. So if, if there are no questions, um, then OK, so th this was uh, I think summary of the exercises. Uh, so compute the historical lifespan in Sweden is the first one. The second one is discuss lifespan and life expectancy. And the third one is evaluate the bias. So you can always come back to this or or the syllabus. But I would so I would encourage you to start working on this um, from tomorrow uh, or today if you want, so that uh, if you have any questions, then we have enough time to solve them. Um, so our markdown, so I downloaded here the, this just to show you how, how this is supposed to work. So can I, uh, you, you have already used our markdown with Tim, right? Yes. Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And did it work? Not for everyone, I think. Not for, yeah, I know Chi had some issues. Is there anyone else who wasn't able to? Um, I, I cannot create PDF uh, files out of it. So I don't know. I'm looking into a solution right now, but yeah, maybe. I don't know. OK. Um, so if we want, we can also speak later to, to see if we can figure it out. So like another option is to nip not a PDF file, but uh, let's see, but you can put a Word document. Uh, for example, you can work, nip a Word document or an HTML output. I don't know if you tried that. Uh, so. Yeah, I mean, we, we. So, is there someone else who didn't, who's having issues with uh, creating PDF documents? Okay, I interpret silence as no. Uh, sorry, I also have the same issue. Okay. Uh, that you cannot create PDF files. And um, yeah. do you? Do you have like a running installation of LaTeX installed? I did install one version, but I think it might not be the right one. But I will have to check that. Hmm. Okay. So one thing that you could try for this assignment is if you want to install the distribution that you have now, um, and uh, and just install the tiny tech. Just the normal. Uh, so can everyone see my R studio? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I could, yeah, I think it's tiny text. So if you just like do the normal install and then reset your R, that might work. So this is a very like R way of doing it, but it gets you gets you through. So maybe you, you could give that a try and uh, and we speak tomorrow to see if it worked. Unless you have already tried this. Okay. Okay. Um, right. So this is the the markdown document, and um, okay. hope this works now. <laughs> but basically, when you knit it, we should be able to see the. Okay. So this should produce a nice uh, PDF file. So there are obvious things that you should change here, your name. Um, and I just copied the instructions here again. Um, so this first line is essentially loading the data into your global directory using data table. And this is why I meant that this is using relative paths. So 
Um, so this is relative to the current location of the R mark node file. So it's better to just save everything as it is. And then there is one page for every exercise. Um, so what, what I will look at when you send me this, so I would expect you to send me a PDF file and the R markdown file with the code. Right, so for each uh, exercise, you can include the, the code in a standard R markdown way. You include all the code that you use to generate the PDF. And um, so then when I'm reviewing it, it's um, it's easier for me to see the process and how you got to, to the outcome, right? So also like in a prominent way, display the outcome. Um, but then we can also have the, the code here and in this case, just showing the first 10 lines of or less of the of the data. Right. So I think this should be fairly straightforward. Uh, okay, so this is that this is it with the housekeeping. It took a bit longer than expected, but if there are any questions, please let me know now or by email. Okay, so now we move to the introduction to digital demography. Um, okay, I'm just gonna go right to it. The, so, so most of you were interested in getting a sense of what digital demography is. And um, so one reason for that may be that it's, so we've been hearing a lot about this recently and uh, it seems to be a very, active and exact, exciting field to do research, but there is very little clarity about what digital and computational demography actually means. And I would argue that that is not, that is not specific to digital and computational demography. So there has been a lot of interest in general in computational social science. Right? So this is something that you will have been hearing about over the, the last few years. And and I think there is probably as much clarity about what digital and computational social science is as there is about what big data is. So, that, so there, I'm gonna get to this in, in a second, but I think we risk there is this risk of this, some of some of these terms becoming buzzwords to the extent that it that they cloud a bit the the actual meaning or the actual substance behind behind these approaches. And this is, as social scientists, this is something that we should be um, aware of uh, because we are interested in, in the substance. Um, so maybe the first part of defining, so, so what I want to say is there is no generally agreed upon definition of what digital demography is. My personal view is that in order to start describing digital demography, we, so maybe we first need to look at the first part of, of the term, right? So digital. Um, so digital can mean many things. Uh, it's not entirely straightforward. So like one, the first thing that comes to mind is digital versus analog, right? So digital is kind of, exists in the world of computers now, um, and analog does not. So another way of thinking about it is online versus uh, offline data. So the way that um, Andres put it at the beginning, so traditional, let's say, data uh, versus this new online. Um, and then the other one is big versus small data. So three of these have limitations. Um, I think the one thing that we can be certain of is so this diagram that you see now in slide 10 is the context in which the, the context that allows such a thing as digital demography to even exist 
is uh, something that in our paper, which was the second reading uh, for today, that we wrote with members of the with our lab of digital demography, is is this idea of the data revolution enabling us to even think about doing digital demography, right? So we think as the data revolution is this process in which there's a spread of technologies and platforms which affect societies in many ways. So like a third industrial revolution, some people say, like maybe that's not so important at the moment, but like to define it as such, but to understand that this, so this, this is it is a fact that these technologies, which include the spread of uh, personal computing and uh, and access to the internet and the world wide web, so it disrupts society in a way. It affects the economics, the environment, the even the demography of uh, of different societies around the world to different degrees. And this idea of uh, uh, penetration is something that we're going to come back to uh, repeatedly, but it also creates a lot of information. And so the spread of internet, the uh, social media, of online advertising, and more recently of the internet of things um, is uh, so has the unintended consequence that data starts piling up, uh, data coming from myriad of, of different sites that were not initially intended to be uh, used for research. And, uh, and that's also another key, um, key part of the definition of what digital demography is from my, my point of view, that we are repurposing data. So doing digital demography means almost by definition to be a repurposer of data where you are drawing on information that was, in many cases, it is the side product of something else. Um, but some creative researchers a while ago realized that, that we can actually use this information to say something meaningful about the world. Um, and this is what we're still trying to do. Um, there have been many um, controversies or like researchers have done decisions, have made decisions that are maybe not ideal. And so it has been a process of learning um, what this data actually entails. So maybe to allow some audience participation, um, this, Somebody want to define Internet of Things? Is that something that uh, you're all familiar with? Uh, Or like give an example of what internet of what thing is an internet of thing. Okay, sure, I can define it. Uh, so, so we think of internet. So we we think as devices, which we would traditionally not have thought of as um, having a connection to the World Wide Web and, uh, or the internet in general, now being equipped with the technology that allows them to interact. So they create this bridge between our online, offline existence and the online world. Um, so basically internet enabled devices. It's maybe um, smart speakers, uh, um, refrigerators with sensors, uh, wearable devices, uh, Fitbit, um, or similar devices for tracking the health status, uh, thermometers. So there was recently uh, this 
team of researchers using smart thermometers to track the spread of the coronavirus, for example. So thermometers where, you, where people uh, kind of self uh, report their temperatures and then you can aggregate this. And um, so all of this, so the idea is that as, as this um, become more uh, widespread, then we can use them for demographic, uh, in our case, demographic research. Uh, but of course, they enable all kinds of, um, all kinds of investigations. Um, the, right, so for the purpose of this course, we're going to be covering three types of data. Um, so the first one is crowdsourced online data. Um, the and I'm gonna say a bit about this briefly now. The second one is digital trace data, and the third one is simulation or made up data, as we can also call it. The okay, so so one question is whether big data is new data. So we can, for example, think of uh, demographers of traditionally having worked with very large data sets. And so census says if you have millions of people, uh, millions of records and several tables that you can combine, like is that big? It's definitely big, um, but it predates the internet as we can clearly see in this picture. Oh, sorry. So, Now, um, I'll just quickly go, so this, um, go through some of the, this comes from the first reading, uh, bit by bit, the book by Matthew Soganek. Um, some of the characteristics, so he defines 10, 10 key characteristics uh, of, uh, of big data. And um, so you can find, like typologies, like many, many typologies about big data online. Maybe the the, 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 main, the, the most popular one is this idea of the three Bs, uh, volume, variety, and velocity, defining big data. And so as I mentioned, I will not use the term big data so much um, during the, in this course, because I think it's, it's maybe more interesting to focus on specific sources and uh, and describe their particular shortcomings and uh, and the potential that, that they have rather than this gen generic idea of big data. But it is interesting to look at the big picture now. So, so the first point uh, is that big data is good. It's big, sorry, um, which seems an obvious statement, um, but but the fact that it is big doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that it is better, right? So you can have a lot of, uh, and he, he gives um, several nice examples of how the fact that a data set is large is not in itself a sufficient justification for using it. Um, and this is, so this is a very social scientific position um, and something that, um, so I've uh, I found uh, interesting when discussing with uh, colleagues from computer science, for example, um, where the type of data can be a justification for certain types of studies, right? So I have this very interesting data set, and like I want to explore it because it's very large. Like that doesn't really work in uh, demography and in social science in general. Um, so like we have to be a bit careful when. Uh, like if the main justification of of using a data set is that it's large. Um, so I'm going to come back to this in a second. Uh, so another another aspect of the of big data that is uh, very useful for us as uh, and it's quite new for social science is that it's always on. So basically, it's always collecting. The data is always being collected, uh, and um, <laughs> and this means, so it, it means that there is like this permanent uh, platform for gathering data, but also that 
data exists. So retros so like this, we can kind of take a retrospective view at different data sources and get information about the past without the kind of survive, uh, survivor or retrospective bias that we might encounter in other data sets. So in this way, it's kind of like looking maybe something that is more familiar to demographers is population registers. So if you look at, at the population register, you can get information about the past, which is in theory as accurate as information about the present. And the classic example is Twitter for the online world, um, where so you can actually go back in time. You can go back three years and see what someone was tweeting. Um, and you can see what they have been tweeting ever since. Um, so of course, there are restrictions about Twitter. But in, in general, like this is the idea. And it's also non-reactive. right? So the, the idea of it being non-reactive is that when you study uh, in social science, it is fairly well known that if you study a phenomenon, you, there is the risk that you will affect this phenomenon. Uh, just by observing it in an experiment, for example. Uh, social desirability bias is the best example of this, uh, or one good example of it. And this bias doesn't exist in the same way in the online world, but of course, it doesn't mean that, it, that the online doesn't affect behavior. Uh, so you can affect it in many ways. Uh, maybe like you don't behave online the same way you behave offline. Uh, so maybe the way that you post is not the way that you, so your opinions, the things that you post are maybe not the same as they are in real life. But like, what is your real opinion? Maybe it's somewhere in between offline and online. Um, but there are challenges and there are also other issues. Um, the, so okay, more things that we have to think about that are not good, that are bad about the online data is that they are incomplete and inaccessible. So, because they were not conducted for research, then maybe it depends very much on what uh, an engineer in Silicon Valley feels like is a good idea. And then maybe they don't think that collecting a, uh, data on age is a good idea, uh, or they don't think, uh, so they make some decisions that we don't know, we cannot access. Uh, so this, there is no algorithmic accountability. So we cannot go and look into the algorithms the same way we can go and look into the sampling framework of a survey. They are usually not representative. Um, and, and there is this, and, and so we're gonna, I'm not gonna stop too much on representativity because this is something that we're gonna cover extensively uh, in, in, this, uh, in these days. So there's another issue that's gonna cause drifting. So, so this drifting means that over, so I mentioned that we can go back and observe things that happened several years ago in the internet. But the one thing that we need to be aware of is that things have drifted ever since. So, and in three ways. So the population maybe is not the same. So users that existed then maybe don't exist anymore. Uh, maybe there was some kind of cohort effect uh, where like at that point there were like many women on Twitter, but now there are no women on Twitter or like some period thing that's going on. Uh, but also maybe the behavior of people don't behave the same way in Facebook now as they did four years ago. Um, and, um, but also like maybe the way in which the, so the algorithms have changed and this is a big problem. Like the way that migrants were defined in Facebook, for example, changed changes constantly, uh, and we cannot necessarily observe that. Um, and then there's also this very nice, uh, so algorithmically they confounded. It means that the algorithms that define the existence in the online world in social media platforms, for example, also affect the, the behavior of people. Because it's like it's like observing people in a casino. So it's what says organic. So a casino is structured in such a way that it will affect the behavior of people to bet more. And the same way in an online world, in a social media platform, social media um, is organized in such a way as to increase the interaction between between users and like this also. So we're not observing a pristine sort of setting. 
Uh, it's also inaccessible. Um, and as I mentioned, dirty. It was not produced for research. And it can have sensitive information that we need to be very aware of when dealing with it. OK, so that's a brief overview. Um, I wanted to introduce some of the pioneering work uh, that um, in this case was uh, research done by the director of the Max Planck Institute, one of the directors, Emilio Sagini. And so one of the things that they started thinking about initially was the idea of quantifying migration uh, using internet data, right? So for example, you can use emails. So if you have a large data set of emails, Um, with IP addresses, then you can link this to some areas, aggregate them, and um, and then you can get this sort of estimates um, of migration, right? So or migration flows. Um, so this is like very preliminary work. Also, the graph may not teach that well. Um, but it connects to some of the current um, subjects that we are interested in now in digital demography. So migration continues to be a large area of interest um, together with uh, methodological developments, also um, efforts to understand internet users and how they use the online world. And then mortality and fertility are also areas that are less active than migration, but uh, still people are working on them. Um, so in terms of methodology, I would think that three main areas of research are how to make inference from non-representative samples, um, how to understand bias online and how to fix it, and how to now cast demographic processing. So, so that you can forecast things in the future, but you can also now cast, like show things exactly as they are right now. And it's something that the internet allows us to do. Um, so, so this is from another um, paper from 2014. Um, and what I basically want to show here is if this is the, the population pyramid of Facebook users defined in some way. But just like stop for a second and think if something strikes you as odd like, compared to what you know about population pyramids. And of course, like this, this does not look very real of, of a national population. Uh, so in this case, many more men um, than women. Um, so this uh, this is a pretty young population, but this is just like, it's very strange. So, so what is happening here? I try to understand what is happening here, if, and if there is a way that we can correct it. So the second big area of interest, I would say, is um, so understanding the users themselves. So the demographic of internet users is, is an interesting area of inquiry. Um, so there has uh, been a lot of work done on inferring the demographic information of users uh, from image and text. So there are many reasons why you would want to do this. Um, some of this research has come from the marketing side of the industry, um, where you want to know who your customers are. But um, if you want to like target ads or something, then you need to know who people are, like what their characteristics are. But there has also been a lot of and and, and often a lot of research coming from the the academic community interested in uh, in political science, for example. Um, in economics, where you want to know who is saying things on Twitter, for example. And since you cannot access this information of age and sex composition of your population, um, then you infer it using some of the characteristics that you can access, such as the, the publicly available pictures. Um, there has been other work, for example, to look at socioeconomic status, uh, some more convincing than others, uh, by looking at what people write in their profile, biographies, sticking to Twitter, or the kind of things they tweet about the language they use. Um, another reason why we would be interested in online users as a population is that we can track inequalities in access to the 
to the online world. Um, and, and the last thing that we can, so like the last thing that I have listed here that we can do is also think about how internet use is an explanatory variable for an outcome that is related to the user, such as well-being. Uh, so we have someone working in our lab also on how platform use uh, affected affects offline outcomes. So we're going to focus. Um, so this is from a study that we're going to come back to in uh, on Wednesday, I think, um, about inequalities in digital access. So this is now casting um, the the Facebook gender gap. So so looking at um, access to internet and the online world through uh, Facebook uh, by using data from Facebook and uh, also tracking it in real time. So you can go and enter this website that we're going to look at uh, in due time. And, uh, and you can see like what these digital inequalities in, uh, are around the world. All right, so there are obvious reasons why we would be interested in that. Um, so the third area is migration. And this, I would say, is uh, where most studies uh, using digital data in demography are focusing now. So estimate flows and stocks. Um, you can do that um, for the past. You can try and now cast uh, this. And um, you can also think of mobility not only of people from different nationalities, but of uh, subgroups. So for example, uh, you can, so uh, I'm uh, working um, in a project now uh, led by uh, Daniela Perrotta on, from our lab also to see how you can use LinkedIn data to uh, track migration of people depending on skills but also of skills themselves, how the skills move across settings. Um, another area that seems to be quite large is the um, assimilation of immigrants. As so we could think of Europe, how we can use information from social media platforms to get a sense of the degree in which um, in which uh, immigrants from other countries are getting are becoming more similar to the population in which uh, that is hosting them of the country that is hosting them so this is another paper that we're going to come back to um, but it's basically um, estimating the stock of migrants uh, from venezuela in spain in this case using both traditional data and then facebook estimates um, so we're going to look at this in more detail so a fourth area of interest is mortality and morbidity. So one, so one thing that we will be looking at is uh, historical mortality estimates. Um, so you can use genealogies, uh, you can use obituaries, uh, you can use registers. And this is, a, this is another area where the line between like what is digital and what is non-digital becomes a bit blurry because the digital revolution has also allowed us to digitize many resources that were written decades or centuries ago that we would not be able to access otherwise. And so we can also think of uh, population registers such as the ones in the, in the Nordic countries as being a type of digital data um, if you want to take it further, then IPOMs uh, and the excellent work that they're doing digitizing all the sources can also be a digital data source. Um, but OK, so that's mortality in a historical perspective. Um, so you can look, for example, at seasonality in flu pandemics in the past. So it's, it's very relevant now. And that information is encoded in these historical sources. Um, you can also use uh, Internet of Things and online surveys to enhance data collection, enhance data collection um, about morbidity, for example. And this is something that also colleagues uh, are doing now at the Institute, uh, conducting a Facebook survey to get a sense of the different components of the coronavirus uh, pandemic and how it is being experienced around the world. 
And, um, and you can also, so there are other people who are looking at morbidity also from online behavior using digital trace data. So for example, discussion um, forums in Reddit or in other kind of online forums where people are discussing different things and then maybe you can get a, a sense of what symptoms they're discussing which um, and link that to characteristics of individuals. So this is a screenshot from tomorrow's paper. It's a paper in science and that is describing the data from the genealogies. And, uh, and here you can see they do some estimates about uh, how age of death has changed over time and um, how the age of death has also changed over time and giving this very large uh, time frame. So from 1600 to uh, 1970. Um, and then around the world. And so you can, so in theory, this would allow us to do this uh, kind of look at mortality. So another area that in maybe is the one that has been studied less um, is, is fertility. So we, there is one, um, so you can estimate fertility in different ways and you can look at different uh, aspects of this phenomenon. So one way is for example, from, from Facebook, uh, you can look at the um, birthdays in networks of friends. So this can give you a sense about the, the births. Um, so there's a paper doing this uh, in uh, Wednesday's session, uh, which is this one. Um, so I'm gonna get back to this, and um, but but you can also look at the discourse online around reproduction. Right? So in which way do people speak about these subjects, uh, and uh, how does that relate to events uh, like terrorist attacks, uh, coronavirus? Um, and one last way, not the only one, but like another way in which you can look at this is. Um, uh, looking at uh, data from uh, online dating uh, platforms. This is something that like, more and more people are doing now. Look at patterns of partnership formation and sortative mating, for example. Um, so this is an example of uh, one paper that is looking at uh, Facebook uh, to estimate male fertility in this case. It should also be in the reading folder. Um, okay, so we are almost done. Um, with this uh, introductory section. And um, well, I hope that next days we will be able to spend a bit more time uh, looking at the substantive uh, aspects of the of these three areas that we'll discuss. But I also hope that I managed to, gave, to give a pretty broad introduction to the area and some sense of what we mean by digital demography. And this is something that like, we will be elaborating throughout the week. A reminder of uh, things I would ask you to do for tomorrow, download the materials, check the assignment in the syllabus and try to see if our markdown works. And, um, and then we can come back to this tomorrow. So it's 1 p.m. now, um, which means that we are uh, close to to so this so this is the end of the session. Um, I hope this was not uh, too much information. And um, so you can always so get in touch with me if you want to discuss something. If you have any suggestions to improve, this is also the uh, the first time I prepare this course in an online version. So I would appreciate feedback. And we can also set up a, um, office hour if if you would like to discuss something more in depth. So are there any questions or comments for today about what we, I presented or some of the more organizational aspects of the course? Uh, 
I really like it so far. I also like um, that you offer the office hours. I think right now I would not know whether to agree some, but maybe tomorrow or the day after. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, thanks. I think uh, I think it leaves a room for many more questions that we kind of expect to be addressed in the following uh, days. So that's good. Basically, it's not like, um, for instance, the, the 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 possibility of making inference with big data is kind of a very interesting topic. And you know, the the way the the court has been. Uh, Thought it kind of um, it kind of gives you the desire to explore that more in the future. So. Uh, and today, so today we didn't have really this space for discussion, um, but we will have them because I wanted to like, go through the course admin. But we will have it the next day, so we can also like have this discussion and we can bring up more things. Thanks. Okay, so I would suggest that we stop here uh, because it's one already, and um, and then I'll see you tomorrow at the same time. Um, and feel free to get in touch if you have any questions. All right, have a nice day. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye